after college, I worked at the University of Florida in uh, the state of Florida and um, got a job with the South Florida Water Management District. And the job was to mostly treat Maluka as a part of their vegetation management program. And over the past 30 years, we've worked with the tree uh, in various aspects, uh, looking at its biology, brand new control methods to kind of um, bring it to what we call maintenance control. It's not really an eradication, but uh, to the uh, point where uh, we have a, the infestation level as the lowest possible levels. And for that, we work with various agencies of the state, including universities, and that's why we have Stephen Enlow here, which we've been partnering uh, in Florida to uh, uh, work on exotic plant control problems. Sure, yes, absolutely. I'm an associate professor at the University of Florida. We have a very strong connections with South Florida Water Management District. We partner with Francois and his organization on the study of the biology, ecology, and management of a lot of different invasive plants across the state of Florida. I've spent most of my career studying invasive plants, and to be able to do this in Florida and to focus on problems like Melaleuca is right up my alley. Melaleuca was introduced in the U.S. in the early 1900s. There were several introductions, but the guy who was uh, credited with the introduction was John Gifford. Uh, it was in the uh, Miami area, and he planted a lot of trees uh, in that area. And uh, the reason were many. Some folks think it was introduced to bring a timber industry to make uh, furniture. Uh, some folks uh, wanted it for landscaping. And also it was thought that it could dry up uh, wet areas, so planted in the Everglades, it would help dry the Everglades to in, uh, increase development. Well, um, I think everywhere. I've even seen Malika grows in a roof uh, <laughs> as a gas station one time. Uh, they can grow in very dry areas and very wet areas, very deep areas, uh, including uh, uh, sawgrass marsh, uh, pine areas, uh, cypress um, uh, areas, so it grows pretty much everywhere. And uh, most of the infestation are concentrated around where it was first planted, which is in the marsh of Lake Okeechobee, in the water uh, conservation areas, um, and it goes all the way down to the Everglades National Park. The number of acres vary, but when we first started, it was thought there was over 300 thousand hectares of Malaluca in Florida, somewhat. Regarding sites, the question always comes up, does Malaluca require disturbance of some type for successful establishment? And in many sites, it is clearly favored by disturbance, so that uh, you do see it come in on where humans have disturbed sites. However, uh, very distressing to, to many researchers, we found that it will invade very intact, undisturbed systems. Uh, so that's a great concern, that it does not require human disturbance. Well, of course it reduces habitat diversity. Uh, as you can see, we're standing here in Guyana in the Malika Dome, and there is very little growing if you look around. There are very few plants growing, there are no birds using it. So that's really the main uh, issue with, I guess, most invasive species. Uh, also, you know, the Everglades is known around the world for its unique uh, ecosystem. And when you have a dome of Maluka or a forest of Maluka in the Everglades, that will totally will change it. So that's why we're very concerned about uh, letting this uh, plant grow uh, uncontrolled. We like to characterize Melaleuca as an ecosystem transformer, not just a disruptor, but a complete transformer, as it will completely take over uh, sawgrass open marshes, convert them to dense stands of Melaleuca. So you've changed the habitat structure completely, you've changed the botanical composition, and subsequently you're affecting multi-trophic levels uh, associated with uh, the flora and fauna. Well, that is what we are trying to stop before it becomes a problem. 
uh, there are various studies who looked into the economic impact and basically you wouldn't have tourists come to the Everglades to see Maluka Forest. They come to the Everglades because it's a special place and they want to see how uh, the Everglades ecosystem is, what it is, and that's what they're coming to see. So if you let Malika grow, you're going to lose that. And also, uh, economically, it costs a lot of money to treat Malika. So it's a big impact, and most um, uh, agencies responsible for um, management of these areas. It is, as we talked about earlier on the, on the savannah, uh, there's a visual aesthetic to open visibility across marshes in South Florida that are characteristic of the Everglades. And when Melaleuca comes in, you reduce that visibility and you go from an open marsh to a closed canopy forest. And again, that is something that folks are not coming to the Everglades to see. So the more Melaleuca, clearly it will yeah, right. affect tourism. So um, fires, that's another, I've, uh, we have a couple issues back in the 80s where Melaleuca fires cause uh, shutdown electricity to Miami. So one of the main power line that had Melaleuca under it, they were burning so hot that the line kind of uh, were affected by uh, the burn, the, the fire and the smoke. So those are issues and that you can have with uh, fires in Melaleuca. Smoke from fires can shut down traffic. Well, um, we look at an integrated management approach where we use various methods that we think apply to control Melaleuca. However, most of our management effort have been focusing on the use of herbicide. So in the early days, we were testing different herbicides to understand how that worked with uh, Melaleuca. We've also introduced several biocontrol agents, which are insects that we brought from Australia to help with the control of Melaleuca. Although those insects are not brought in to kill the tree, completely. They're there to help suppress the uh, flowering and production of seeds and that helps us uh, in our management with herbicide. And uh, we do also in occasion use uh, uh, fire and uh, flooding when we can, when it's possible. Um, and uh, we combine all these different methods dif depending on the areas that we were that we are doing the treatment. Um, overall I would say about 70 to 75 percent of our management practices are with uh, herbicide, whether you're doing it directly to the tree or using uh, aerial application. And about um, 20, uh, 15 to 20 percent would be the biocontrol, and uh, the rest is about uh, mechanical. So as far as the management aspect, that's how, what we do at the South Florida Water Management District. But the nice thing about getting the biocontrol agents out there, that cost is complete. So they have established populations, have spread throughout South Florida, and now provide considerable suppression of seed production. Uh, so suppressing the numbers and definitely slowing and reducing the, the continued invasion and spread of Melaleuca. So that's kind of a upfront cost on the host specificity testing uh, required to ensure those insects would be safe. Uh, but after subsequent release, uh, that cost goes to basically to zero, which is nice. Right, and what we're experiencing with the biocontrol is in areas where you had to go back every year, now we can wait two, three, sometimes four years before you go back because the biocontrol are suppressing the seedlings that are coming back. Uh, as far as costs, uh, it can get very expensive. Um, costs may range between uh, $500 per hectare to three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 per hectare. Um, depending on the tools that you're using, if you're doing aerial application, you can do vast areas, very uh, uh, less costly. Uh, if you're using mechanical control, it gets very, very expensive. The most expensive. The most approach. expensive. Bring and, heavy machinery in. and as uh, Stephen mentioned, biocontrol at first, like the first Malaluka bug, uh, cost us about a million dollars, and it took 10 years before it was introduced. But it's been introduced since 1998. And I think we have recuperated that money because of the fact that in some areas, we're not going back as often as we used to. Per year, uh, currently, we're spending about three to four million a year in Malaluka, about. 
in the beginning it wasn't that much but we have one area called a refuge which um, it wasn't uh, taken care of when we started the Maluka program and that's the importance of starting early because if you let the infestation grow it gets more expensive so where we were spending uh, a million dollars in conservation area three which is in the south of uh, the areas that we manage and conservation area one we're spending about three million a year now so it can be the the difference if you let the infestation go without control uh, i think um, uh, many people are looking at uh, this program as one of the most successful uh, invasive species program uh, in the united states um, and the reason was not just because of one agency, the South Florida Water Management District, is because of the cooperation of all the agencies and the funding. And that was the important part, is to make sure everybody understand what's going on so everybody's controlling the Maluka and their land and also lobbying legislatures and uh, politicians to make sure that these programs are funded. This was, a, this was the seminal invasive plant in Florida that brought people together in a collaborative fashion. So it brought federal, governmental agencies, state agencies, local, mm -hmm. city governments, private conservation groups, the general public, uh, the universities together. And industry. And industry was a large partner in that too, to focus and strategize on larger scales and to get essentially get on the same page so that people would know what is working, what's not working, and how to work together. For example, um, in Lake Okeechobee, we have a hundred thousand acre, about what, forty eight thousand hectares. hectares marsh that was probably thirty to forty percent covered in Maluka. Today, there is very very few trees left there, so that was a success. And the water conservation areas, uh, which is about uh, two hundred thousand hectares. Um, we still have some infestation there, but most of them are very, very clear of Maluka. In the beginning, they were about 25 to 30 percent covered in Maluka. Now we have less than 5 percent covered. So we've made a lot of progress. We have brought it to a level of maintenance control, whereas uh, we've controlled the large infestations and now follow up seeking out those new seedlings that recruit and uh, very small infestation, so those incipient populations. Um, and we get on top of those very aggressively, and that results in a continued suppression and prevention of new infestations. The term eradication is thrown out there by a lot of people regarding invasive species. Right. The data on successful eradication is not so positive. <laughs> we, we know uh, it can be done in, uh, in specific situations. Uh, many rodents on islands, there's been some successful eradications. New Zealand has done some really good work there. We also know the larger the extent of the infestation, the lower the probability of eradication. Good data across many plant species in North America, uh, suggesting very small acreage uh, infested. When you get on top of it then, uh, then you can successfully eradicate it. Same thing from Australia. The key is maintenance control. You're going to bring it down to a level that you can maintain that is not costly to maintain. And eradication maybe early on, if you can catch it very early, possible, maybe. But once it's established, it's very difficult. That even in a situation like this, uh, we have many examples in Florida of addressing Melaleuca heads like we have here and taking this cover down and eliminating 99.9% .9 right. of the Melaleuca on many sites just like this and converting them back to open sawgrass marsh um, and, uh, and other native vegetation. So it is possible. Well, now we can say that we have it under control. Uh, it's a matter of continuing our uh, monitoring and surveying to make sure that we don't uh, allow the infestation to start again. Uh, hopefully with biocontrol, that will not be a problem. We have some weeds in the United States, uh, such as alligator weed, that is no longer a problem because of uh, biocontrol. And that's why uh, it's important for us to establish biocontrol, because eventually you may not have to do anything except monitoring and surveying. Knowing how this tree behaves 
it is very likely that if it was left in control, the Everglades that we have today wouldn't be the same Everglades. And we would have Maluka everywhere because it was a very uh, aggressive tree uh, before the biocontrol were introduced. And without uh, treating and managing it, uh, the Everglades would be uh, in danger. The bioclimatic modeling that has been done uh, has suggested an incredibly broad distribution across the entire uh, peninsula of Florida and then along the southern Gulf Coast of, of the United States. Uh, so the climate is there and is suitable for a much broader invasion uh, within Florida and the United States. And without uh, intervention efforts, uh, there's a good chance that uh, in 50 years we would have been talking about Melaleuca Everglades. Well, in the early days, it was very positive. Um, it's still known as a, a menace in Florida. People don't like the tree, especially when it's flowering. It uh, produces this odor that people don't like. And people, uh, it's also a, an irritant. It's not really an allergen from what I understand. Um, at first, we did a lot of publicity and that's one of the uh, management program that was very well received compared to other programs that we have with uh, at the district, especially with the aquatic plant program. It's, uh, we have a lot of negative press uh, about those programs. However, Maluka, for some reason, people were very happy to see that we were doing something about it. And I guess it's also related to the Everglades because people cherish the Everglades. And since it was a threat to the Everglades, they were very happy to see that uh, we were doing something about it. And back then in the 90s, we had no complaints. Most of the complaints that we received were to, can you come take it out of my backyard? <laughs> exactly 20 years ago um, in 1999, uh, then President uh, Clinton signed the first ever executive order on invasive species in the United States. This really brought invasive species to the forefront of ecological attention, where historically it had been marginal at best. And this brought a tremendous number of academics into the field, building the field of invasion ecology, and in terms of outreach and extension, vast efforts on educating the public on the threat of invasive species. So over the last 20 years, we've seen tremendous progress on our educational efforts, and general public awareness of invasive species has increased greatly. So we have a program that was developed in Florida, and it was a partnership from University Cooperative Extension, called TAME Melaleuca, yes. the T-A-M-E, TAME Melaleuca program. The university came in and partnered uh, to get the word out, really educating the general public, holding a tremendous number of workshops and seminars and lectures uh, uh, throughout Florida to educate the general public, to educate land managers on the, the threat of Melaleuca and what to do about it. Yes, in the early days, um, there are several people that were looking into doing different things with Maluka. Uh, furniture was one of them. Um, also using it for uh, producing electricity, where they were chipping the trees and taking them to a, a power plant and burning them for electricity. But um, overall, we didn't encourage that because we didn't want to see people starting to grow it for economic purposes. So uh, at the district and uh, amongst all the governmental agencies, we really discourage the use of invasive species for economic uh, gain. So where we fail to learn from history, history seems destined to repeat itself. And we have seen this occur over multiple generations with many invasive plants. But today uh, we tend to resist those efforts a little more intensively because we have learned so much from history with past failed introductions. The genus Melaleuca yes. uh, does have species uh, with, with many medicinal properties, tea tree, another one that's often confused with Melaleuca. Uh, we mm -hmm. have not embraced that industry in the U.S. at all, um, overall, uh, but there are people who are interested in, in the medicinal properties, but it's not caught on on a large scale. Again, the example of Florida speaks for itself. Um, the primary thing to me is uh, coordination between all the stakeholders, all the agencies involved, to make sure that uh, if I start a program in my territory, 
then you make sure you have a program in your territory because if I if you don't then you'll be infesting my areas once I control it so coordination and between the agency is very important uh, the second thing would be um, uh, funding uh, getting um, the state to understand uh, how and the need to appropriate funding for the control of Maluka. And then thirdly is the management approach uh, using an integrated approach to control it. So those are the key things to me that uh, were a success with what we did in Florida. I'm going to add a fourth key to that. In the world of invasive species, uh, we often find charismatic leadership highly energetic people who are willing to take on this massive challenge and they can persist for entire careers <laughs> um, doing a fantastic job at this. And it's very important that the next generation of leadership be raised up within organizations to continue to address these problems. We have found uh, where people have retired and we have lost that institutional memory that the younger generation was not prepared for the problems and we're not able to uh, maintain the fight. So it's mm -hmm. very important that you raise up the next generation of leadership. Uh, it's very similar from what I've seen so far. Um, it invades in uh, seasonally wet areas and does very well. And uh, as in uh, Florida, there's many other areas that I see, like in the savannas, I'm sure Malika would do well in those areas also. Um, so, no, I don't see much difference. And I think it's doing very well. Uh, <laughs> the only difference is it seems like it's on an early stage. Uh, in Florida, uh, Malika was introduced in the 1900, but it wasn't until 1970 when people started to recognize it was a problem. And then it wasn't until 1990 we really started the program. So I think Guyana has a chance to do something different and to start early before it becomes a big problem. The other thing, the most noticeable thing to me was the immediate health of these trees. Uh, exceedingly vigorous, uh, very lush and healthy. Uh, since we have introduced the biocontrols within Florida, uh, the trees are often much more stunted and exhibit a number of characteristics uh, of damage from the biocontrol agents that have suppressed their reproductive outputs. And so in general, I see much healthier trees here, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> First thing is, I would say, get a plan. Come up with a very clear plan. Make some determinations about what you want to accomplish. Make sure you have the resources allocated to do it. Find the proper partners and collaborators that will be needed for the greater effort in French Guiana. Come up with the resources, the financial resources, and follow up, follow up, follow up. You do all of those things, you can make tremendous progress. Haphazard, limited stabs at Melaleuca will result in inevitable failure, and we can't even recommend that type of approach. Uh, so you really do need a plan. Right, and to summarize again, coordination, funding and also i would add public awareness to make sure people understand the problems of invasive species particularly maluka and also for them to support their government to make sure they fund those programs because funding is the key and uh, making sure you follow a plan Pour plus d'informations sur le programme Life Biodivum, rendez-vous sur le site web www.lifebiodivum.fr ou sur le Facebook Life Biodivum.